Can you hear in the back? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me introduce the subject <clears throat> and how you're going to be, what you're going to be doing. When I was growing up, my uh, great uncle was writing the, had written the history of Leibensburgs in America. And he published it in 1943. And he still continued to visit churches and cemeteries and regularly he would, he lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. He would come to Allentown and spend time with my father, who was head of our family historical uh, reu annual reunion event, and my grandfather, and they'd go visit cemeteries. And I'd go, go along with them and run around the cemetery and watch what they were doing. Um, as I was putting this book together, when I retired, I, I was determined I would write my autobiography primarily to tell my grandchildren and my son how I grew up and came from a East Texas nerd to a president of the Timken Company. And I thought that could be my contribution. But the more, after I retired, I started to work on this, reading history books. The more I worked on it, the more I realized my church, my faith, my friends, and my family did to develop me into what I became. We lost your mic somehow. I don't know what's going on today electronic wise in this room I got a full battery talk to say something can you hear me so. well cuz the hand mic I have here isn't good for far away so um, we were trying to get something closer to his uh, um, to his mouth. So I'm not. Can you hear me now? Yep. Good. So as I was working in this, the more I did this, the more I realized I was not only telling the history of my, my life, I was telling the history of the church, at least back to Martin Luther, because I can trace my lineage back to Martin Luther. And then I told you last week I did that genetic study and they took me back to Cro-Magnum in southwestern Germany. So I said, I can trace my lineage from the beginning of time. So when I started to write my autobiography, I, I actually started at the beginning of time. So that's why we start with the 13 million years ago. Now let me tell you where I am and what, what I'm, why, why I'm presenting this to you because you're, you're going to help me critique my, my book. Um, I've been working on this since, like I say, since I retired, not with great intention, but off and on. And more recently, uh, I decided I better, I better do it or it'll never get done. So right at this point now, I got things pretty well written up through um, Martin Luther and beyond. Probably I, I have a lot written about my early life and, and uh, my early working days at Timken. 
and I, I know what, I, what I'm going to be writing the rest of the Timken, and then I'm going to have a conclusion that I'm still working on, but that's where we are. Now, I've, I've met with the um, publisher. I'm going to use a local publisher. Hey, TJ, could you give me a cup of water? Um, I've, I'm going to print up about a thousand copies. Half of them I'm going to give to people like you for attending this class. You will get a free book. <laughs> and right now, I'm, I'm, this will be the final review of my script, of my script. From here, I go back to the to the uh, publisher, and they'll start working and putting it together. So that's that's kind of the plan. I thought when I decided to do this, I thought I'd all I'd have to do is come here and. Uh, present the final version of it, and that's all I would need. But as I, as I put this thing together, I realized I had to change a lot of things in my, in my draft. So it's changed quite a bit. And like I say, I'm going to ask, some, ask for some of your input along the way as I continue to go through the rest of the is this working? So I'm, I'm going to take you through the beginning of the book. And this is basically word by word with places I'm going to ask you for some comments. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first day, light was created. Second day, we all know this, the third day, dry land, seas, plants. This is directly out of the Bible. Now, this is my proof of God. God created matter, solids, liquids, and gases in an expanding space and time by violating humankind's first law of thermodynamics that says you can't create something from nothing. Someone that can create something from nothing has to be special, supernatural, and spiritual as far as I'm concerned. I kind of told you last week in college, and we did, I did this, I don't know if this is done in every college or what, it, if it's just part of what, what it started in my freshman year. We used to have jam sessions at college, kind of regularly talking about God and religion and was there really a God and all that kind of stuff. And uh, as I told you, I think it was my first Thanksgiving at home. Um, I was talking at the Thanksgiving dinner table and talking about the things we were talking about in school when my father thought we should be studying math and physics and all that kind of stuff. And I got, had my first Damascus Road experience. <laughs> he did not like what he heard me talking about God and church and what I believed in. So that's where we, we start from. I think it was in my, I was in a fraternity house and these discussions would continue where we, when I was taking thermodynamics, we came up with this, you know, the first law of thermodynamics says you can't create something from nothing. And all of a sudden I realized, you know, maybe there is something to this God. And that's where I started to, I guess, ex become f f uh, believing in God and the church. Initially, until you went to college, 
knowing there was a God or believing there was a God? Oh, I, I, was, I was in church and Sunday school every Sunday, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> that was my mother's contribution to my upbringing. She made sure I was in church and, and of course they, they went. And the church that I grew up in was the one that my ancestors built and my family had been members forever. Well, yeah, I, I didn't have any choice about whether I went to church or not. Okay, so God's communication and relationship with humankind to tell us what our mission on earth is to be and to know how to do it takes place in the amazing brain he created in us. Humankind actually has two brains, a left brain and a right brain, one of which genetically becomes dominant at birth. It's the ultimate computer that the digital age has copied. It processes data, has a memory, and intelligence to make changes and to design it, and, and is, in, is designed to do different jobs and through a genetic code transfers its know-how over generations. And that's what I was saying the other day. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that like what, I, what my father's brain gave to me, I went to college, became an engineer, way beyond what he, he always said, he never got past the 10th grade of school. And then, you know, as I started to work with my grandson, working in, you know, when I, when I started to work with Kurt in the basement when he was growing up with my tools, about 15 minutes after I was, he was down there, he had his nose in a paper or some book on the, on the floor, had no interest in looking at the engine. Compared to my grandson, when I took him to the basement when he was four or five years old, he wanted to be doing it. And Grandpa taught him how to do it. And fortunately, you know, I had retired by then. So I used to pick him up in the summertime and two, three days a week, and he'd help me polish the cars and clean them up and work in the basement. So he was tutored from the time he was five years old and working with the tools. And now he's added the cell phone. I can't believe the things that he undertakes. I've never to undertake some of the things he does now. All he does, brings up his cell phone, and oh, there's the instructions to do this, do that. So I'm, I'm convinced the brain that God gave us, if it's nurtured, and it has to, you know, it has to be nurtured and worked with, but you know, like when he would, when, when he would pick up a tool, I'd have to show him, and instantly he'd do it. If you do that with some other people, you have to work with them a long time to get them to figure out how to use it, like my son. You know, he's starting to do work around the house, but he, he does not handle tools the way I do. And he's, as we talk about left brain, right brain, he's definitely a clone of Donna, no question. And she was, you know, I was left brain, she was right brain. Kurt is right brain. Andrew is left brain like me. And here, I don't know, look, look at some of those. What a left brain, the characteristics of the left brain, you know, they think logically, they use facts, the math, linear thinking segment, compared to right brain. Like, what do you think you are, left brain or right brain? You're left brain? I figure you're an engineer. Yeah, yeah. You ever think of what, what brain you have? Anyway, <laughs> 
So as, so as I said, because you know, I, I go back a long way, when I realized I was part of Cro-Magnon Man, I said, well, when I write my autobiography, I might as well start at the beginning of time. And really what is happening now is it's not only my autobiography, it's the history of the church. As I go through it, that's the backdrop of, of how the church has evolved and some of the problems it's getting into today with members, not with the loss of membership. And all, you know, the, the Christian church is growing in Asia. In America, it's declining. Okay. When God created this binary world, left brain, right brain, um, sin, and living a good life, when God created a binary world by taking a positive proton and a negative electron, charged hydrogen atom, and with a big bang created 92 other elements in the periodic chart of inorganic molecules. Then organic matter was created to complete the matter in the world in which we live, work, and play. In this binary world, choices have to be made. Here they are, you know. Uh, just to run down the list. Serenity and anxiety, freedom and tyranny, freedom and free and slave, honor and shame. You can go through that list. War and peace, right and wrong, faith and doubt, faith and fact, rich and poor. And, you know, when we talk about creating something from nothing, where did the, where did the atom come from? The, the, the negative charge and the positive charge. And, you know, it, it had to come from somewhere. There had to be a place to put it, space. You had to create space. There was time to evolve. Somebody had to do that. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll accept the fact that it was God's. Like I said here, you know, you have this binary world and you have all of these comparisons, but it's why the atomic bomb works, why the computer, the computer works on digital technology, zero, one, zero, one, yes, no, yes, no. That's the whole way the computer works. So it's based on this binary world that somebody created. Now, when I create something, I kind of like the nurtured, and like, you know, when I create something, I create it for a reason. So I get involved. So God, when he created this thing, he was involved. He had to be involved. Why else would he have created it? So, like I say, this, this really convinced me that there, there has to be God. Now, The earth, life begins. Earth was first formed of living life began about four billion years ago. Tree shrews, those are like squirrel-like mammals, appeared 55 million years ago. Primitive prim primates appeared eight to six million years ago. Homo erectus, that's upright man, that's what we are, considered the first hominoids appeared in East Africa about two million years ago. Homo sapien, the first modern human, evolved from the, these earlier hominids, hominids predestined between 200 to 300,000 years ago. And there we are. Primitive primates appeared eight to six million years ago. You know, initially, as you see, the, the limbs become shorter, the arms, as you evolve, Homo erectus, upright man, considered the first hominid appeared in East Africa about two million years ago. Homo sapien, the first modern human, evolved from these earlier hominids, like I said earlier, 200 to 300, three, I put 316,000 years because that's the oldest 
fossil they have, skeleton they have found, three, that they say is 316,000 years ago, that was modern man. And then Cro-Magnum and Homo sapien commingle, what, I, what I'm saying there. These different, um, like Neanderthal was a different species than Cro-Magnum, modern man, Homo sapien. They started to commingle, and that's what was happening in, in Germany. So in Germany, where people that kind of go back in the beginning of time, they're a combination of Homo sapien and Cro-Magnum. Okay. The Homoi lived in small kinship family related tribal communities of 75 to 100 people. They were led by a family elder, a head or chief, and they had a shaman who had special spiritual powers. The shaman was looked upon, and there were, apparently every, every tribe had one, was the place the chief turned to to understand what God wanted him to do. Their tools for hunting were made of stone. They had plenty of time to play, to paint, to dance, to make music, to worship. Chiefs sought the counsel of the tribe Charmin regarded as having access to and influence in the binary world of good and evil spirits. They prayed for good weather, hunting, and plentiful harvests of foraged food. They believed in an afterlife and worshipped their ancestors. Their spirituality became a religion, the role of which was to assure survival, build confidence in the chief's leadership, and promote cooperation and control of the members of the tribe. And I've used this for a long time now. Rule, ruler, and religion were one in the early form of theocracy. And that's what it, the, the fact that the ruler of the, of the clan ran the, 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 uh, the tribe, and he was the one that, through the shaman, had the access to God and your salvation. Because they were already, pre in, the, in the digs that they had, they find, you know, the remains of funerally. Uh, they, they already buried people, they had flowers, they had things that related to their spirit, spiritual world. And that goes back to the beginning of time and the fact that the government and the religion were one existed up to Martin Luther. And Martin Luther is the one that separated that. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Okay, the hunter-gatherer, when man first spoke, anthropologists have concluded around 50,000 years ago, Homo sapien began to use symbolic interaction, speech, thought, and language to plan, create, invent, and can communicate during the hunt. Cave paintings hint of rich artistic life showing Homo sapien, Latin for wise man or knowing man, art and music. There's a, I, uh, obviously a, there's a hunter in the background there, dear, but they have, there's a lot of these and I couldn't find one that I could use that, because uh, what I'm, I, I'm writing this thing now, and when I go to publish it, I have to get the, the uh, um, a license to use the, the f things I'm doing. So I'm working with a company called Shutterstock and in Getty Images. So I go on there, and I pick out a slide like this one, or an image that I want to use, and by what I, the fee that I paid allows me to then use that in my, in my publication. So that's the best I could find. I wanted to find one that was, had some religious symbols, but you can find on the internet, but I can't figure out how to get approval to use it. Okay, the most important record of religious history resides not in books and sacred texts, but buried in the earth. Ancient graves, statues, temples, sand, standing stones, sacrificial offerings, and place 
of in initiation all bear witness to the uni universal human quest for spiritual power and understanding. Even earlier in the times of Neanderthal, some of the tribes de deceased were laid in their graves with flowers, possibly symbolizing resurrection after death. Now, there is no evidence in archaeological digs that ancient hunters gathers clan ward. There's no, no indication that they ward with each other. I think if a hunter-gatherer got, got tough, they simply moved on. And that's how I think primates moved from out of Africa around the world. These primates who evolved into Homo sapiens, modern man, according to the out of Africa hypothesis, began to globalize and migrate out of Africa, initially heading north or east, then north, starting about 70,000 to 100,000 years ago. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, globalize and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on earth. And that's Genesis 1, 28. Is that where Adam and Eve fall into place? The what? Is that where Adam and Eve kind yeah. of fall in place? Yeah, Adam and Eve, what they call the out of Africa hypothesis. They say God first put Adam and Eve in, in Africa, and then they spread from there. Now, according to National Geographic, that's that test I took, uh, and it, it, it gives a map of where you came and doesn't put times on, but it shows you how you progressed. According to National Africa, IBM Research Partnership Study of Ancestral Lineage, using the author's genetic marker by Leibensberger, Leibensberger DNA, was part of the, the Eurasian, what they call Eurasian Afrin, Adam. Uh, and that's, they have classifications, haplogroup U migration that started like 45,000 years ago. Eurasian Adam, Adam migrated east from Africa to the present day Middle East and then north toward Europe through modern day Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Belarus, Poland, and Germany. Now, Donna. It was interesting, her family was part of a hallowed group, K, that took a more direct route north through modern-day Ethiopia, Uganda, Sudan, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Turkey, Russia, and then into Germany. So I went first into the Middle East, and then my, my family went first to the Middle East, and she came directly up through Spain. Okay. 11,000 years ago, the out of Africa migration had reached the shores of North America. I live on the shores of Nobles Pond, a 13.7 acre glacial moraine lake, which 11,000 years ago had a stream of running through it from the melting glacier north of the present pond. Archaeological digs show that in the fall of every year, each year, Paleoindian tribe would come to the area to hunt mastodon to provide sufficient food to survive the winter. So what they did, these people moved around. They would, they would actually go down to Kentucky to get their, their spears and things like that. But they'd always come back in a number of groups. They'd meet at Noble's Pond every year in the fall to, to get some uh, mastodon, which they would smoke to preserve, and, and of course they could fish on the, on the stream that was going through Noble's Pond. Noble's Pond actually did not have an exit, but it has an underground passage over to Shady Hollows, the lakes in Shady Hollow, and they put, when they were deciding that they had to put a drain pipe in, they actually did a study that showed that that's how Noble's Pond drained. But originally, that when the glacier was melting, that was a river. that obviously follows the same path that it does today. Now, in the spring they would head, this is the 
people who know salt in the spring, they would head south to rendezvous with other tribes in present-day Kentucky to trade flint for their spears. There is archaeological evidence that tribes regularly rendezvoused to trade goods and exchange mates. There is no evidence that different tribes warred with one another. If tribes became too popular, overpopulated, they would form a new tribe and move on. Now, by the end of the Ice Age, 12,000 years ago, uh, 10,000 BC, Homo sapien had settled Africa, Australia, Europe, Asia, and Americas. But humankind was in one of the biggest game changers, the agricultural revolution known as the agrarian area that would, would be with us until the Reformation. In the regions of the Nile, Egypt, Tigris, Euphrates, ancient Mesopotamia, modern day Eastern Europe, Turkey, northern Syria, and Iraq, and the Jordan River, modern day Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and Jordan, the climactic changes that occurred, the melting of glacial caused the water to rise some 300 feet between 10,000 BC and 9,000 BC. Now, this is actually shown scientifically that they had, that certain parts of that where Noah's Ark would come would, was was flooded. Uh, so there's actual evidence, but the problem we have is Noah says it occurred around 23 B.C. Uh, and the science says it happened 10,000 years ago. Now, in the Bible, nothing is said about the Ice Age, but we know of the great flood that Noah was part of that occurred around 2348 BC, according to biblical texts. And the world history in accordance with the biblical chronology does a great job of comparing secular history with biblical history. And that's, that's what they do on that chart. So, and then in Genesis 6, 14 through 16, in Genesis 7, 1, God tells Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. In studying this chart, one thing that always bothered me was that the age of Noah and his ancestors lived to Noah's lived, Noah lived to be 930 years. His descendants through Shem, with whom God, along with Ham and Japheth, made their first covenant to settle the world after the great flood that followed. Now, here's the numbers in parentheses of the age Seth nine, lived 912 years, Enoch 905, just look at them. This is the lineage that you go down on the, on the biblical record, and then they have secular history that they compare it with. So now let's assume that there were using a different, let's assume that they, that uh, Noah's time, there was a different calendar, that day and night was much different. Now let's assume they were using a different system to account for their ages, just as God's historians took poetic license in describing billions of years as days in this creation. Also let's assume that they lived only 37 years instead of 837, which, which 837 is the average of all those years up there. Add that to the, tw oh, and if you take 800 uh, times eight, that's the number of in there, and uh, you end up with 6,400. You add the 23, 64, and you get, it, that if you make that adjustment that they only lived as long as we did, kinda, you end up with moving the timeline from 2348 to 8748, very close to the time secular history. Uh, the Earth, according to archeological studies, experienced a great flood. Now, we're gonna end here, but there's is possibly another uh, explanation. The 
guy by the name of Bielokowski. Wrote a book, Worlds in Collision. And his theory is that in around the time of the Exodus, there was a comet that came toward Earth and almost collided with Earth and caused all kinds of chaos. And that's what we're going to discuss next Sunday. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we wear helmets next Sunday? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's really quite interesting. He, he presents his theory in this book, and you can see it. And then he writes about you know, the, the, uh, the pharaoh during the Exodus was Ramses II. And he has a whole book explaining how Ramsey lived in a different world. And that's what caused the, the calendar to change. So come next week and you'll hear the rest of the story. <laughs> Any questions? The other thing I, I, I presented the uh, uh, to this point, I, I tell the history, like I said, but with you, I just gave some explanation about my experience. And I, as I've been putting this together, I've decided I'm going to include some of those personal experiences. I think it brings, it kind of connects me to the world history. So what do you think of that? Make it a little bit more personal. Yeah. Yeah. So from what happens now is I, I, I have a proofreader that Don was doing my proofreading and I have a good friend who's agreed to do the proofreading. So what I'm going to do is make the, this is the actual first chapter, word for word. So what I'm going to do now is include some of these other things we talked about and then it goes to my proofreader and then it goes to the printer. And then we start putting the book together. So hopefully by, I said by the end of the year, I'd have the book published, but I think it's going to be a little bit longer. Might be the end of Sunday school in May. So any other, any questions? Well, if not, see you next week.